Hello and welcome to a very special virtual tasting here at Betts Family Winery. My name is Maggie and I'm the customer service manager and today our winemaker, Lewis Skinner, will be sitting down with our founder, Bob Betts, for a tasting of our Père de Famille. They'll be tasting through 14 different vintages as well as throwing in a fun little surprise, the 2012 La Perenne for a comparison. So, open a bottle of Père de Famille, make yourself comfortable and enjoy. Hi everybody. I am here with Mr. Bob Betts, MW, in front <laughs> of all these vintages of Père de Famille. Now, today we have uh, a flight of Père de Famille. We're really excited about it. Um, being that we can't see all of you right now and coronavirus is going, we thought we would take this time to sit down, talk about Père de Famille, why Bob started making it in the first place, the differences in the vintages, where they are today, and where we are going in the future. And I'm super excited about it. Bob drove all the way out from Kirkland, which is <laughs> almost 10 minutes from here. 12, 12 to, Yes, yeah, to get yeah, to yeah, the yeah. winery. So we're super excited about that. Um, we also, last night, last minute, Bob and I were going back and forth and said, you know what, we should probably throw our 2012 La Perrine Reserve Cabernet, Reserve Cabernet in the flight today. So it is in here as well. Really excited. Uh, vintages, the oldest vintage we have today is 1999, which was the third vintage of uh, Cabernet at Betts. Technically the first vintage labeled as Père de Famille, and the newest vintage would be 2017. So we're spanning quite a distance. I'm going to turn this over to Bob and let him uh, talk a little bit about uh, Père de Famille and the origins of it. Good, let's do it. And I'm sitting here with Mr. Lewis Skinner, okay, winemaker at Betts Family Winery, an extraordinary talent and uh, thrilled to be here. We don't get to do this all the time. Uh, this is, you know, we taste a lot of wine together, but it's a lot of young wine. And having an opportunity to do this retrospective is, is rare. And it, what, a couple of things that it confirms for me is these wines are children of a common mother. And even though over the years we have changed various vineyards, we have certainly experimented and changed cellar protocol, how we treat them in the cellar. Our cooperage, our barrels has, have changed over the years, but there is an intent to focus on Cabernet of a particular style that I think we had all the way back in 1997, the very first vintage of, of our Cabernet Sauvignon, that carries through. There are vintage variations, there are protocol variations, but there is a unity based on, first and foremost, of course, the Columbia Valley, the hero of our story, which where we grow the grapes, despite being in different vineyards, there is this overall pattern to the Columbia Valley. And I think you see that, but then you see the individual vintage variation. So it's a very exciting opportunity for us. Uh, a, couple of, a couple of comments. When my wife and I started the winery in 97, Cabernet was the big dog, and today it still is the big dog, and it's, it, to me, is Washington's greatest wine grape, red, red wine grape, and we wanted to focus on it. In my, my past life, I had been involved with all kinds of uh, varieties, white and red and, and uh, pink and all that stuff, but we really wanted to focus just on red wine, and Cabernet being, the, to me, the best red grape in the state, we really wanted to focus there. And that has been our quest. We've experimented a lot along the way. You'll see an evolution of personality, that experimentation we did, but you will also see this commonality of density, fabulous color, a penetration, and a definition of the Columbia Valley, I'm not in right now, that makes its way through the uh, to the wine. So let's have at it. Let's jump in. Uh, looking forward to this. Let's do it. All Starting right. with the, let me just say, 1997 was our first Cabernet Sauvignon. We called it Alpha for the beginning. 1998 was our second Cabernet, and we simply labeled it Cabernet Sauvignon. By the third vintage, this 1999, we were so convinced that it was the leader of the pack for us. We called it father of the family, French père de famille. Uh, and uh, that's what this wine has maintained throughout its history. The addition of this very special wine down the way here, the uh, Le Perrin, is 
It's a great opportunity for us. We've only made that wine twice in our 22 vintages mm -hmm. here. In 22 vintages. And uh, 2005 and 2012, and the 2012, as we shall see, is fully worth making it as a separate wine. We'll get there down the way. Lewis, you want to jump in on the 99 here? I do. So the, the 99 is a, a bit of a favorite of mine uh, for the, when we're talking about Père de Famille. It's a very cool vintage in Washington State. And uh, like I've, I've mentioned before, um, cool vintages in Washington, cool vintages just in the world with Cabernet Sauvignon can often be a bit reticent and shy, maybe when they're, uh, during their elevage or their raising in the barrel, after bottling, on release, e even a few years uh, post-release, they can often be very tight. But I, I feel like a lot of the time they can, uh, you know, maybe go the distance a little more than the other wines. Maybe they have a little more acidity, maybe they have a little more phenolics, or maybe they have the, maybe they have a little more herbaceous character to them that will actually evolve into something interesting um, in the second and third decade of life. And I know that's not always the most popular thing to say about Cabernet Sauvignon, but I do see that. I see that in 1999, I see it in 2010 and 2011. But the 1999 is very special. I think Bob was really just starting to get into his stride with Cabernet Sauvignon, so this would have been vintage number three, uh, making Cabernet. Uh, the alcohol is very, what I like to say, balanced here. I think the alcohol on this only hit high 13s, 13.8. 13.9. Yeah, 13.9. Yeah, and, and I think uh, it really shows in the wine. I really like the, the way the, the weight, the ethanol, the structure are just all kind of matched here and the tannins have started to just melt away. There's so much interest in the nose, uh, in, the, in the flavor profile. It, it really is a favorite of mine. And I, I think it's, maybe it's, when Bob talks about the plateau of wine evolution, I think it's right there up at the top, which most people ask, how long will, will this Cabernet last? Or how long will this certain wine last? Well, this is more than 20 years old, and I think it's, it's, it's probably, for Père de Famille, it's, it's right in the top of that curve. Maybe in the next few years, it'll start kind of going down this other end, but I, I think it has a lot of life left in it. I agree. I, it does still have this penetration, and that's, a, that's one of the goals that I think we had made for our Cabernet Sauvignon, is this penetrating beam of fruit, which this wine still retains. Yes, it's complex along the edges, and it's, it's more... Um, uh, it's softer on its phenolic impression, et cetera. But beam of fruit with all of this additional saddle leather complexity that comes along, a little bit of rock, a little bit of whetstone sort of note to it. Um, this wine is unique in that it's one of the few, it's the first vintage that we added Cabernet Franc to the Cabernet Sauvignon blend. It's 5% uh, Cabernet Franc, 18% Merlot, and 77% Cabernet Sauvignon. Early on, my goal was to jam as much Cabernet Sauvignon into it as we could, but I felt in those first several, uh, first probably five or six vintages, that it was important to have some of these other grapes in there to uh, give it additional flesh and complexity. Uh, Cabernet Franc, I want to say, contributed some of that herbaceous note that you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. where you have that uh, dried thyme note, dried bay leaf possibly, and um, we kept that f until 2005, I mm -hmm. believe, was the last vintage we used Cabernet Franc. Now, of course, as we will see in these later vintages, Petit Verdot has made its way into the product blending here for real benefit for the wine. So um, just a, a really good example of 21-year-old wine uh, with, with still some vitality but all that complexity that we'd be looking for. And that consistency with the 2011, especially in terms of the penetration of a cooler vintage. Yeah, and you know, I'll, I wanna talk a little bit about a, a couple of things Bob just mentioned, which is um, one, the different grapes we use uh, when we blend Père de Famille, and then also the different uh, sourcing. When I say sourcing, the different sites in the Columbia Valley, particularly the Yakima Valley, that we use to make Père de Famille. So I think when Bob started, well, I know when Bob started, he had uh, a very specific idea of what he wanted to make just stylistically for Cabernet Sauvignon, but maybe even uh, more important than that is, he, you know, he had been studying wine for a long time, traveling a lot, certainly during your years at Chateau St. Michel, and I think Bob had kind of 
planned out Père de Famille to be a representation of the vintage every year. And he knew that not every site is gonna be perfect every year. So having that diversity in grape type, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Petit Verdot, and having that diversity in sourcing um, higher elevation sites, uh, west facing sites, south facing sites, um, it, it means a lot to, for quality and it, it, it gives us a lot having that diversity. It, it helps, I'd like to say it helps us take advantage of the best of every vintage and I think it's one of the reasons that you can hopefully see the vintage shine through every, every year with Pair de Famille but also able to keep that quality year in and year out. I think that's always something that, well, I like to think that, that a lot of folks look at Pair de Famille and say, you know what? every year Pair de Famille reaches a certain quality level and that's not easy to do and I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, with diversity. Exactly, you and I, I'm not sure we've ever spoken about this, but mm -hmm. you really hit it on the button. Even though I'd been in the business, say, let's see, 20 some years by the time we made a vintage like the 99, I didn't feel so sure that I knew the greatest vineyard or vineyard region in the state and I wanted to continue playing. So over the years we have uh, had fruit from the Yakima Valley, the Wallop Slope, Red Mountain, this real range of Yakima Valley, actually, from the east to the west, uh, from Walla Walla, from the Horse Heaven Hills, various vineyards in each of those sub-appellations. And what's interesting now with what, we're, what Lewis is doing with the, the current vintages, and we had made the transition back in the 08, 09, for more and more Red Mountain fruit. And I think you'll see the Red Mountain influence in these later vintages, these younger vintages, that um, are the product of the experimentation that we did mm -hmm. in these earlier vintages. But I, as a, as a uh, wine lover, pardon me, I, I'm much closer today to thinking I know where the best vineyards are in Washington than I was in 1999. The next vintage we have chosen is 2003. And I want to point out the first four vintages we're tasting today are all very different, 1999 being a very cool vintage. And then the next three, which are going to be 2003, 2005, 2007, they're all what I would consider to be fairly warm um, Washington State vintages. Uh, all four of these vintages, we picked them because they were successful in different ways. They all have different ser sensory characteristics, but I think it points out that you can have a very successful result in Washington State or in any part of the world um, with enough intention and detail and some luck in there as well, but I just wanted to point that out. So the 2003 is the next uh, vintage that we're tasting of Pair de Famille. 2003 was very warm. I know uh, it, a, a lot of people that were working the vintage, I, it was a little bit before my time in the wine industry, were very concerned about the early heat we had, the early bud break. And um, the harvest season, the actual period where the grapes were harvested and picked, was very warm. So the fruit temperatures were a little warmer coming in. So anytime you're around uh, or you're working a vintage that's, let's say, warmer than you're used to, um, grape growers, winemakers are gonna be concerned about that. What I think is most interesting about 2003 in the Bet Cellar and maybe other cellars and other Washington wines that I've had from the vintage, I think it's actually, um, I think it's surprised everyone. It's actually been a pretty balanced wine. The ethanol in, or the alcohol level in the wines had never really achieved the, the, the kind of the, the high water mark everyone expected that it would. A lot of people are able to actually pick early, including the Bet Cellar, and I, I think that the 2003 is kind of an, an overlooked Washington vintage. It's, it's not only an overlooked vintage uh, uh, from, from Betts family, but it's a, um, it's a vintage that I think is really in full stride. I would drink the 03 before I drink the 99. Okay. As of right now. I could the, see that. The, uh, the phenolic balance in this wine, the tannin, the, the structure on the side is plush and rich and inviting. Um, the alcohol is about a point higher than the 1999 uh, percent higher, but it doesn't get in the way. It doesn't make it clumsy and hot or anything. I think this wine is in is pretty full stride right now. Um, I'm getting these really dark fruits, blueberry. I hope you don't mind if I say iodine. There's a little bit of this iodiney note that you get with Bordeaux varieties, uh, minerals, tar some sweet, very sweet pipe tobacco leaf, 
A uh, little bit of oak, but the oak is not a, a finger pointing out at all. It's, 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 just, it's just balance. And I, I love the balance in this wine right now for drinkability. Me too. Uh, so, and what you said about it, uh, potentially consuming it before the 1999, I, I, I'm with you there. I really like the juxtaposition between these two wines. It's really fun to, to taste the 1999, the product of a, a cooler season, a, a, certainly a cooler harvest period, and then 2003, which was kind of the, the, the polar opposite, much warmer. Uh, much more uh, herbal tones in the 1999, uh, maybe almost menthol tones in the, mm -hmm. in the 1999. Mm -hmm. The 2003, like Bob said, bigger, rounder, already maybe a bit softer, and the fruits definitely lean more toward um, the black fruits, blackberry, that, D that range. Mm -hmm. Not quite roasted coffee bean, but, but on its way there. Let's talk for just a second about this thing. Lewis and I are all referring to this, uh, we're both referring to this warmer and cooler season. We talk and we study and we pay very close attention to what we call heat accumulation during the growing season. Basically, April 1st to October 31st is, is typically what we define. We always watch what happens beforehand and afterward. But what we'd realize is there's a difference between climate and weather. The Columbia Valley has climate. What's its general pattern? Low rainfall, highlight intensity, low cloud cover, uh, this temperature range, this minimum and maximum temperature. Weather is what influences a specific vintage. And that's really what we're looking at today is mm -hmm. this weather variation with the, the foundation of the climate for the Columbia Valley, but this individual vintage weather variation. And you, two wines could not be more different than the 99 and the 03 in terms of their heat accumulation between the two years. Cool, downright almost cold 99 and this really warm, intense period that we, uh, growing season that we saw in 2003. The final thing I'd like to say about that, and we've talked about it before, it's not just a question of how much heat you get, but how you get your heat. We look at daily variations and distribution. We look at monthly distribution. We look at seasonal distribution. And those all affect the final character of the wine. You might start with a very cold spring and end up with a very hot end of the season, or vice versa, you still might get the same raw number, but the vine and the berries themselves and the resulting character of the wine is clearly different based on not how much heat we got, but its distribution through the growing season. I think the 2003 is ready to drink right oh, now. I love it. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't wait on that one. I it, think it, it certainly has life in it, but I, I, I like where it is. That's dinner. Okay. Let me go with the 05 because that, uh, the 2005 vintage of the Père de Famille is the first vintage of Cabernet that we made in this winery. The uh, prior vintages were made in warehouses up in the Woodenville Warehouse District. And by 2003, my wife and I realized in order to make the wine we wanted to make, the way we wanted to make it, we wanted to have a winery dedicated to making wine the way we knew it should be made. So we you know, bit the bullet, uh, you know, threw the dice and built a winery from scratch. And um, no looking back, I was so pleased we did it because there are things that are built into this winery that help us as winemakers do what we know ha has to be done. 2005, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly a special vintage for many reasons. Bob pointed out that uh, it was the first vintage here at this facility, which is really neat. But I think, you know, outside of just our group here and, and the winery, 2005, I think a lot of people, fans of Washington State wine, winemakers, consider it to be kind of a benchmark vintage for Washington State. Um, I've, he I've heard a lot of people say, if you couldn't make good wine in 2005, then you probably shouldn't be in the business. I don't know if I could agree with that entirely, but it was a very successful vintage across grape types, uh, across different areas of Washington State. It was, it was very successful. Uh, a warm year, um, bud break, not, I guess not unlike 2012. Bud break was happening about the same time as, as 2012. It was kind of a, a, most of the season you could say would be typical, long-term average, which doesn't sound like much, but that's what we always hope for. Mm -hmm. the, the actual harvest period was a little warmer than that, and I think 
people had to be on their winemakers had to be on their toes a little more in 05 than maybe some of the other vintages because ripeness, grape ripeness was progressing quite, quite quickly in 2005. But the results, I want to, I like to think anyway, 2005 could be maybe one of the longest lived wines in the best cellar for Père de Famille and maybe in Washington State as well. It's one of those vintage I th vintages I think is really going to be timeless. And again, we always go back to 2012 because it's a, a little more recent in our memory, but uh, 2005, every time we've tasted this vintage, it's shown well and not just well, but bright fruit, lots of intensity. It has the structure and the flavor profile to really probably go the distance. And I think that this wine is probably still on its way up the curve. How do you feel about that? Uh, I, I'm with you. Uh, the, the fruit is now in a transition period from oh, the blue notes that we'll get out of young, young Cabernet, the pure cassis. The fruit is becoming more black red and deeper, richer, a little bit of wet stones, aromatics to it. And on the palate, I think that's what is the strongest indicator for me that this thing is going to continue. It has some of the plush, this plush, Ness that the 2003 had, but it also has this, this strength, this sense of force behind it. The alcohol is a little bit lower than the 2003, and I think it's, um, it's got ways to go before. It's, it's in the middle of its plateau. Okay, we talked, we've talked before about adolescence and maturity and plateau and decline, and this is in the middle of its plateau, and this has got many years of good drinking ahead. So if you've got some, try a bottle. And save a couple. 2007. Again, this for what we're tasting today, 03, 05, and then to the 2007. This is really three very warm, successful vintages in Washington State that I think are all considered as uh, kind of kind of ideal harvest seasons. And the wines that have turned out from it have been have been compelling. What I like most about the 2007, I'm I'm quite familiar with it. I've I've had it on a number of occasions in the last couple seasons. I really like how it capture something that I think Bob and myself are always looking for when we're thinking about like stylistic considerations for the wine. I think it kind of captures this new world fruit and power, but I think it also the, the aromatic signature of it is, uh, it's reminiscent of the old world. Uh, I, I, just over the seasons, I, I know that Bob is always a fan of when you have those kind of crushed herbs, maybe fresh herbs like thyme and bay leaf. It's not easy to come by that aromatic profile. You have to kind of have everything line up for you, pick right on time, and to really be able to capture that. And I really like that about the 2007, is it, you know, it has that extra layer, not just the fruit, but it has those kind of non-fruit components. And I, and I, like you said about the 2005, the transition period it's in, I think that the 2007 is still holding on to that primary fruit, but I like that it's that kind of combination of almost new world fruit and old world spice. And what Lewis just mentioned, is how I look at Washington Cabernet on a macro basis. Um, for me, Cabernet Sauvignon is a continuum from old world structure on this side to new world fruit on this side. And maybe at the far extreme of new world fruit are some very fleshy Australian or Napa Cabernets. And maybe on the, um, the old world uh, part of the continuum would be the, the most powerful, most structured of Bordeaux reds. Washington is old world centric, and to me the best of Napa are new world centric. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you've got these far outliers, and what you have for Washington and Napa is center movement, but Washington uh, leans just a little bit to old world, and Napa certainly leans to the, to the new world. What you'll also see with the 2007 is the move to a greater percentage of Cabernet Sauvignon. This one is the first time we had hit, let me look at my notes here, I think we hit uh, 86, uh, 85%, pardon me, 85% Cabernet Sauvignon. It was the first time we had gotten that high, and we were more and more successful, partly because we had moved to a greater percentage of Red Mountain fruit by this time. Mm -hmm. We had started pulling back there's no Cabernet Franc in it, as there were in a couple of the younger vintages. We fiddled around with Malbec for a, a couple of vintages earlier. Those are gone. By this time, we are involved with Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Petit Verdot to define our Cabernet Sauvignon, and a greater emphasis on Red Mountain. And I think you're beginning to see this future evolution 
the predecessor of what was to come with the 2007 vintage. You know, one, another, another note, sensory note that I pick up um, when we, by the time we get to 2007, I start to see the barrel program or the influence of our, uh, kind of the barrels that we buy and the barrels that we age in. I kind of see the, the progression become a little finer as we move this way. I think that's a bit of an inflection point for me when I look at, at the wines. I really like the oak signature in 2007. I mean, I like it here as well, but I feel like there, I, I can see the evolution when we taste through the wines and I really like kind of this trend that we start seeing from 2007 forward. Uh, less new oak, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. We had focused with more new oak in the earlier vintages. There's a little bit less new oak. It's still in that 60, 65% range. The other thing that we notice about 2007 is that we started racking less. Racking is when you move wine from barrel to barrel, drawing off clear wine from the sediment that has naturally deposited to the bottom of the barrel. The earlier vintages, I followed a classic Bordeaux model of every three months trying to soften phenolics and tannin and, and getting the wine, the clear wine off every three months. Well, we moved more to a five or six month and then in later vintages, even less than that, uh, the distance between rackings. And I think that there is a preservation of fruit elements mm -hmm. with lower oxygen contact mm -hmm. in starting with the seven and then moving to the newer vintages. A couple of profound aspects of making wine in 2007. 2008, I think this was one of those sandwiched vintages that I regret that it was a sandwich vintage. 2007 was it was hot stuff. 2005, people expected, well, 2005 Cabernet Sauvignon Pair de Famille from Betts Family was Seattle Times number one wine of the year. Okay. Okay. It, both the wine advocate and Steve Tanzer had given it 95 point ratings. People expected a lot. Along came 07. It met the same standard. Mm -hmm. By the time we released the 2008, we had gone through this very fleshy 2009 harvest. Yep. Okay. Uh, the eights were still in barrel when we went to the nine harvest. And people were thinking 07, 09, and forgetting about 08. And I regret that they did because I love this vintage. Well, I, I remember the, the, the 08 vintage as far as after it was bottled quite a bit. Um, because when I got here as an intern working harvest 2010, you gave me a case of mixed 08s. And that was kind of my first, uh, that was my first... I guess, introduction to the Betts 08s, because I don't think the Bordeaux, the Bordeaux, the Cabernet Sauvignon Pair de Femme had not been even released yet. Right. So uh, right. It, was, it, it was kind of just uh, something that we were enjoying at that point in time. But um, since then, I've, I've kind of formed different opinions about it in Washington State and in the Betts cellar. I agree with you. I think it's, it's such an underrated vintage, and I think it's, it's been drinking well, it continues to drink well, and I think it will in the future. What I like most about it is it just, it's, it matches a medium weight with kind of a medium structure. There's so much to like there across the, the, the Rhone grapes and the Bordeaux style grapes, certainly with Pair de Femme. I just, I really like the texture of this wine I always have, and the aromatic signature as well. It kind of has all those things going for it, but I just, I like how fine the texture is on, exactly. on the 2008, and I like how subtle the aromas are. I don't need, every wine every night of the week to be maximum volume and so i guess i really appreciate that about 08 it has so much detail and subtlety and kind of a medium weight package as we winemakers define what we're looking for in wine we always talk about elegance grace balance etc i think you can point to the 08 right now and mm -hmm. saying that hits all of those marks it's it's graceful it's it's never going to be the biggest boy on the block but it's just, it, it pulls me in with its grace, its finesse, and its balance. I love that one. And it has a very, not a pronounced acidity, but it's a, it's, it has a very lively acidity. I think that's one of the things that's always attracted me to the 2008 vintage, and paired for me specifically, is that lively acidity. And I guess I, I wanted to go back to what, and talk a little bit about what Bob said about where Washington State falls into, the, I guess, the spectrum of where Cabernet Sauvignon's grown, using the most, I guess, for me, the most two recognizable places that Cabernet Sauvignon has grown. So when you think about Bordeaux, France, when you think about Napa Valley, and then you think about Washington, and I know Bob said maybe Washington somewhere in between there, there's actually a pretty good reason, not, not related to specifically weather, but more climate. So if you think about Bordeaux, France, it is on the southwest corner of France, 
and, it, and it, it's very much influenced by its proximity to the ocean. So it's, I mean, because of that, it's a, it's a maritime climate. The, the daytime temperatures are somewhat, I guess, moderated or buffered, as are the nighttime temperatures. And so there's a very specific character from there. In the Napa Valley, it's more of a Mediterranean climate, warm daytime, warm nighttime temperatures. In Washington State, we're, we're kind of an unusual place to grow Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, we are what most people would consider to be an inland continental climate, meaning that we have very high daytime temps, but very cool night temps. And because of that, because of that big diurnal shift, our, our, our grapes chemistry, you could say, we retain acidity late into the season. And I know a lot of people talk about that and how that puts us maybe somewhere stylistically in between the two, but there's actually very good uh, I guess mechanics that you could think about or look at or um, I guess those are the drivers when I think about Cabernet Sauvignon and why it's Washington State so distinctive. When you think about other places that have an inland continental climate it'd be like Burgundy and you could talk about parts of Spain and the Northern Rhone and places like that. So it, it's really unusual and I, I love that about Washington Cabernet is that it, it is distinctive and there's a reason for it. And it's not just acidity that is maintained by this day-night temperature mm -hmm. difference that we have. It's the actual flavorings and aromatics of the wine that are more preserved at night with those lower temperatures. And, and this ripening month period that we've talked about in the past together of the last four or five weeks before we harvest, our day, uh, day max and night minimum temperatures can be 40 degrees difference. And we have excellent opportunity to create sugar, and physiological maturity in the grapes during the daytime, but at nighttime they close down and there's this preservation of acid for vitality and vigor within the wines themselves, but also can give us this, this preservation of those flavorants and aromatics that I think are key to Washington Cabernet. And I'll get on my soapbox, and some of you have heard this before, don't get greedy. Okay, don't say I can hang it for another three weeks on the vine and get more aroma. You, you're gonna get dehydrated aromas and dehydrated flavors. And I, I just, for me, it's getting the grapes, not at this one precise millisecond of when they're ripe, but at this range of flavorant and aromatic purity that gives us wines like this. I think uh, you were leading into talking about the 2009 when you're talking about these picking decisions, yes? Exactly, because with 2009, as with 03, we had to make some picking decisions that, oh my God, this is early. We've never picked this early before, but because 2009 was one of those hot years where we had this sustained hot, hot uh, weather over the, uh, over the growing season, and the potential for ultra-ripe fruit, dehydrated, raisined, fruit was, was a real potential. We've got a big, plush, developed wine, but it still has this vibrancy of fruit behind it. You know, I think the 2009 is in a sweet spot right now. I, I see a lot of the same similarities with 2005 mm -hmm. for flavor profile-wise, mm -hmm. bigger, darker fruits. Um, surprisingly, and maybe not surprisingly, probably related to earlier picking, the 2009 actually has a certain vibrancy to it that I, that I can really appreciate. It actually has a little more tension on the palate than maybe even the 05, and I know there's a few more years in bottle with the 05, but uh, the 09 is actually offering a, a, a lot of generosity right now. You would hope that at two th uh, 2009, so what is this? Uh, we're recording this in 2020. Uh, this is 11-year-old, not quite 12-year-old wine that we would have that grip in Cabernet Sauvignon, mm -hmm. that we would have that, we, we value with Cabernet, not with Beaujolais Nouveau, but with Cabernet Sauvignon, we value longevity, giving the wine the opportunity to create and manufacture and to develop its secondary and tertiary aromatics and palate impression. It's happening with the 09. Agreed. It, it's, it, this has that grip. I like your comment about the 05. 05 has the same characteristics. The volume is just turned down a little bit mm -hmm. because it's got that four years of extra age. 2010 and 2011. These are our, uh, what we consider to be our, our cool vintages in Washington State. I, I'll never forget 2010 because I was, a, I was an harvest intern here working with uh, Bob that season. And I, I remember... Uh, the concern on everyone's face as the season, uh, as September turned into October, and uh, and we had very cool weather, uh, a lot of small rain events, 
and it, it, was, it was an unusual year for Washington. I think we would have had to go back to 1999 to have another season that finished so cool, and in fact, 2010 and 2011 both ended up finishing actually cooler, you could say, less heat accumulation, uh, more rain events, and so it definitely challenged us. Where the wine is today, we tasted this, I guess, what, two days ago, mm -hmm. and so I, this mm -hmm. wine's pretty fresh in my mind, but where we finish with this, I, just, I think it, it highlights the fact that Washington State, you can have success in, in a warm year, in a cool year, in a challenging year, you can have success in each one of those years. It just, it depends on how interactive you are with the growers, with the vineyard and the seller. Those seasons, it's something actually that Bob said um, for a long time. It's been, a, I think, a philosophy of Bob's, which is, uh, I think the, the hope is that we can usually, in, a, in, an, in an average season or a typical season, not have to manipulate the grapes much or the vineyard protocols much. And so hopefully we can be as hands off as we can in most years. But in those seasons when we need to be aggressive and be in the vineyard more and pay attention in the cellar more, we can kind of uh, turn the volume up to 10 and, and, and really just be detailed with every lot that comes in, every pick date, every consideration for a new barrel or barrel aging time. And I think uh, 2010 really highlights um, the success you, you, you can have if you pay enough attention. It, paying attention to how much fruit you're harvesting. The vine can only produce as much fruit successfully, successfully is the, is the key issue, based on how much heat it gets during that growing season. And in 10, you had to be pretty conscientious. And what I'm seeing out of this 10 today, more than I did the other day, is this purity of cassis, black currant, and I, I'm out on a limb here, but I'm still seeing a primary strawberry note way in the distance aromatically for this wine. That to me bodes very well because it was cool, but it's still fresh and we captured it. And it's going to lead to better things, even, uh, even additional aging in the cellar. I love the juxtaposition between these two wines, kind of how I talked earlier about the 1999 and the 2003, this juxtaposition between uh, a cool year in 99 and a very you know, classic, war warmer than classic year in 2003. I love that about tasting the 2009 and the 10 side by side, is you see this broader texture, uh, bigger frame for the 2009 where the 2010, everything is, is, is finer there. The weight is a little less, it's more of a medium weight. The, the texture is finer, the aromas are more subtle, and I can appreciate both. Yep, yep, uh, Sophia Loren and um, Catherine Deneuve. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can appreciate them both. Or maybe we should say Anthony Hopkins and Arnold Schwarzenegger okay. to, to be generous across all genders. Okay. Um, yeah, they, they both have their place in, in life. So 10 and 11, um, following up on the 10, we learned a lot of lessons about cool climate viticulture and winemaking in 2010 that we fortunately or had to, by necessity, apply to 2011. Because 2011 was even cooler and it demanded absolute attention to detail in the vineyard and consequently in the cellar picking decisions. Uh, we harvested this back, uh, the fruit for this wine for the most part on the 11 in, um, this was all very late October. We harvest, in these early years, we typically harvested most of the Cabernet in early to mid-October. By 2011, this was really pushed out to late October. And uh, we needed all of that heat accumulation to get these, the grapes that ripe. You know, a couple things I remember, being here in 2010 harvest, I'm going back now, I want to say, I could be wrong, but I think it might have been Charlie Hoppus mentioned, you guys should uh, appreciate 2010 because we might not see <laughs> another one. It's so rare to have a vintage like that. And then 2011 came on, yeah. came along, right? Yeah. And it was also the first year when Steve and Bridget were here for, right. uh, for, for harvest. So I know that it was, uh, it was, quite, the, it was quite the welcome for, for them yeah. to be here with uh, coming off of 2010 and then having uh, 2011 happen. But uh, I think- <laughs> They wanted to move back to Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think, I think the, comparing the 2010 and the 2011, I think it highlights something important, which is it's always difficult to predict how a, the, the quality of a wine, the character of a wine, based just merely on the growing season. I don't say merely like it's not important, but 
2010 was actually just a little bit warmer than 2011, but I think maybe 2011 might be a little bit more of a dramatic wine than 2010. In it is end. for me. Yeah, I think yeah, the 2011s have turned out to be uh, qualitatively and stylistically a little more interesting to me, though I, I like them both for different reasons. I think there's a little more power in the 11s, a little more of that, that, that complexity and almost going back to that um, herbal character a little bit that I think has evolved quite a bit in, in the bottle since, uh, I guess, nine years old now. Very much so. This is, this to me is, back in the 70s, we were making Cabernet like this. If you look at the 78 Cabernet from St. Michel, 76 vintage also, there was this focus on pure cassis and then these wonderful, sweetest of herbs, um, really good thyme and bay leaf and maybe a little anise coming out, but I love that about the 11. This is a, this is a sensational vintage for Cabernet. Yep. So, Bob, I'm going to have to let you lead with talking about 2012 because it was, in, it was important for us here at Betts, for the state of Washington. It, it's considered by many, and a lot of local winemakers, including wine critics, as a, a benchmark vintage, something we're constantly comparing maybe our, our, our newer vintages against and, and older vintages as well. I mean, I think we, it, it has stuck in everyone's mind for its quality, not just in Cabernet Sauvignon and Pair de Famille, but also just across grapes, uh, other red grapes, white grapes. It was just a vintage, I think, that was very generous to all grape types, and a, a lot of people had success. It was a defining vintage for Washington in as much as it is... It was without exception. It was without, you know, the unseasonal rains. It was without a really torrid spring uh, or, or, or a very cold spring. It, it was balanced throughout the growing season. And we just kind of uh, thinking, what's going on here? We had just come off of three challenging vintages, nine, really hot, 10 and 11, very cool. And we got to 12 and we thought, Mother Nature blessed us with a year that we could maybe take time to um, see our families or whatever. It wasn't quite so crazy. And to not have to uh, do a lot of rosaries and, and all that stuff in 2012. That being said, there's always the skepticism, and I think Lewis has rightly pointed out before, you never know until you know after this wine has gone through fermentation and barrel aging and in the bottle, etc. But 12 didn't disappoint, and it gave us material, with Cabernet Sauvignon especially, that really hit a, a wonderful peak in this cellar here. And it was the second time in, at that point, it would have been uh, 13 or, no, 16 vintages that we made Le Perrin, the, the godfather, um, because the, the wines were so good in barrel that we were able to make a, a wonderfully successful Père de Famille Cabernet Sauvignon, but we also had nine barrels of Cabernet that played together extraordinarily well, and we produced this, this Le Perrin <coughs> as a certain reserve. I, I don't like the word reserve when it comes to wines. I think it cheapens any wine that it's applied to, but we thought by giving it the godfather name for our family theme, was a way of making it distinct and letting people know that it was truly something special. One of the criteria that we set in both 05 and 2012 when we made Le Perrin in both those two vintages was that by making this special wine, we cannot detract in any shape or form from Cabernet Sauvignon Père de Famille, which is our, for me, it will always be the wine I was destined to make and I never wanted to take anything away from it in making something even more special. And I think we accomplished it. The, the 12 Père de Famille stands on its own brilliantly, and then the uh, Le Perrin is another dimension. Very different wines. So I know we're, we're kind of, we're talking about 2012 just as a vintage, and then we're tasting both the wines, which is the 2012 uh, Père de Famille Cabernet Sauvignon and the 2012 La Perrin Cabernet Sauvignon. Certainly very different wines. The 2012 Père de Famille, uh, classic Père de Famille. I can see the, the family resemblance between uh, the 2012 Père and, and all the vintages that came before it. Um, it has the tension, the aromatic complexity, the weight. 
Uh, La Perrin is kind of a very different thing. I think the texture is even a little finer. The, the, the weight is a little, is a, a little more substantial weight. And the aromatic profile mm. is, is certainly more exotic. I think it kind of combines uh, fresh leather and aged leather and bay leaf and thyme and cassie and currant. I, I think it's, it's paired to me, but maybe just broader in, in, in every aromatically weight wise yeah. length on the palate. This tablecloth is black, but it could be blacker. And yes. That's what I see with, with mm -hmm. the Père de Famille and the Le Perrin. And there's a good reason, okay? So the numbers su support differences. The, uh, the Père de Famille Cabernet Sauvignon is 90% Cabernet Sauvignon, the highest percentage we'd ever achieved at that point. It's 6% Merlot and 4% Petit Verdot. It's 84% Red Mountain, 8% Yakima Valley, and 8% from the Horse Heaven Hills. The Le Perrin, on the other hand, is 100% Cabernet Sauvignon and 100% of Red Mountain. And so it's not just the varietal mix, it's also the origin of the fruit that lends to the differences. And I think this, this muscularity, this expansion of aromatics, structure, and flavor on the Le Perrin, when you think about what it took to have a season, or I guess what it took to make these two wines and how 2012 came together and the influences that finally resulted in, in these two wines, the season had to be warm but not too warm. When you think about the crop load, it was at most of the sites that we, that we sourced fruit from from 2012 had, I don't know how to say perfect, but a perfect fruit set just a naturally moderate yield, and the season was very long. It, I could go down a list of a lot of other things, but um, we didn't have highs that were too high, we didn't have lows that were too low, we didn't have a freeze stop our season early. I mean, it just you could, ha you could have a, a laundry list of 100 different metrics. You could say, well, this could have thrown us off this year, or we had cool weather at the end of 1999 that kind of cut the vintage short. 2012, it kind of just it had all these different these different influences teaming up to have a season like that. You could pick in, you could pick Cabernet September 15th if you chose. If you wanted to have riper flavors, you could pick Cabernet October 20th if you chose. So it, it was a very, like Bob says, it, it's an average year when it comes to weather and heat accumulation, but also um, a very special year. And it, we had a lot of stylistic, oh, a lot of stylistic choices. Like I said, early, late, um, the skins were of the Cabernet berries, I was at DeLille at the time, were almost this, again, am I allowed to say perfect? Almost this perfect <laughs> thickness. And when, I remember tasting the grapes, the condition of the grapes when we got them in. It was just a year that everything thing teamed up. Yeah, yeah, it was good. You know that wines like this can happen only because we know every barrel. And we've said it too many times at the risk of sounding like a broken record. It's the fact that we have multiple notes during the post-harvest season on every barrel that allows us to make this. The, the, uh, the Le Perrin was made from nine unique barrels, and we went over and over and over again, making sure that they were not only different but better, and that they didn't detract from the, the barrels that went into the Pair de Famille. And there were four different sites, all on Red Mountain, uh, three barrels from Ciel de Cheval Vineyard, one barrel from the old block Cabernet Sauvignon at Cayona Vineyard, and then two barrels of one clone and three barrels of another clone on the area that we call Heart of the Hill today mm -hmm. that has become a, a major source of really high quality fruit. Those barrels were chosen specifically, I just, before our discussion today on air, I went through the books and looked at our real intent, uh, intensive efforts to identify those barrels that were not only different, better, but played well together. And we come up with this wine. When we talk about 2013 vintage in Washington State, uh, Bob kind of had, had coined a, a term for it that I, that I like a lot and I've, I've used a lot since. Uh, 2013 was still in barrel when I came back to Betts family in 2014, so I got to kind of be involved with the, with the blending on it and, and bottling it, of course. 
but uh, Bob likes to call 2013 a, a tale of two, two harvests or two vintages, and I, and I like that a lot. Um, it was certainly, you could, you, I think we classify it as a warm vintage. Uh, Heat-wise, probably comparable to some warmer years, nine, seven, um, but that heat really kind of shaped a couple different grape types, a couple in, in, in very specific ways, depending on when they were gonna be harvested. So we had a lot of heat during the season leading up to the early harvest, which were like earlier sites of Syrah and earlier sites of Merlot. So for those grape types here at Betts family and the rest of the state as well, I think the wines show, uh, they, show they, they reflect being picked under warm conditions and a lot of heat up to that point, which is they're more exuberant, um, bigger, broader, wider, um, darker fruits. You know what happened in the second week of, of September, I remember because um, I, I was at DeLille at the time, but uh, the weather cooled down and our sellers in, in Woodenville here, where we make wine, they all started uh, actually, uh, we started gaining some room back. because Emptying. The, the, yeah, em <laughs> emptying, yes. And it, I think it was a phenomenon that, that most of us around here saw is when the weather cooled down, the ripening slowed down. And so when you talk about those grapes that are usually later ripening, like Cabernet Sauvignon, it kind of put some extra, some, it, it, it gave them some extra hang time and it put some distance between that, that first kind of round of harvesting, which were those early grape types, and kind of the second round. And so uh, a lot of us, we were draining and pressing, draining and pressing, and our cellars were just becoming more and more empty. I, I, I know some, some of our neighbors, they actually had no fermentations going, going on anymore. They were all pressed and in barrel by the time we actually started picking Cabernet, which is well into October. And so what I wanna say about how that relates to Cabernet Sauvignon and the 13 Pair de Femme in general is I think uh, those grapes types, Cabernet in particular, that ripened kind of later in October under very cool conditions, I think they show a little more freshness, a little more delicacy than maybe the earlier grape types. The, the, thir the 2013 vintage for, particularly for Syrahs and Merlot, more brooding, bigger and, and intense. And I think there's a certain delicacy and detail in the 2013 pair that I, I really appreciate. And you see that with the definition of fruit aromatically in the 2013, there is this, this ripe, but very bright, almost uh, spiced candy, uh, uh, red candies, uh, cassis candies, um, uh, black, black raspberry candies to the nose mm -hmm. on this wine yeah. um, that really take it into a, another dimension from what we've seen before. And it was due to, that, uh, due to that cooler ripening period, an even cooler one than some of the earlier vintages. And having this, this ability to focus on Cabernet and I, it's been a while since I've had this, and the nose is, is different. In fact, I'm getting to the spot where I'm kind of classifying in my mind some of this, the earlier, more mature vintages, this early mid-tier. 13 breaks with that, and this is clearly a younger wine that's gonna need even more age. I mean, it's pretty beautiful today, mm -hmm. but uh, this is gonna need more age to fully strut its stuff. Maybe almost like the 11 in a way, more, more red fruits, yeah, yeah, yes? Yeah, 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 it's, it's more red fruits and more candy than the 11. The 11 is more dried herb direction. The 13 is more of a candy, not a sweetness, but a candied, um, candied black raspberry, candied cassis sort of direction. I think the 13 will hit, it'll be a few more years before the 13 hits its peak. Yeah, yeah very good. And so now we switch to these, to the new, vintages. Lewis was fully back here. He was on the pathway to becoming uh, the winemaker as I'm pulling back farther and farther in 14. And he really took control of the cellar. And I think what you'll see from a protocol standpoint, from a fermentation um, vessel standpoint, 14, 15, 16, and 17 show a greater and greater influence from Lewis's input. And as it should, okay. Um, with no disappointment, uh, let's let's jump into the fourteen. What did you did? What did you do different? Well, you know, I think I think fourteen. Fourteen, I think, was a little bit of a, a handoff there. So I think that we were, we we both had input on, on the fourteen more, maybe more than some of the other vintages where I was kind of pushing s some different directions stylistically. But I think twenty fourteen. What I do remember about it is the it was a season where the the raw the raw fruit coming in, the grapes coming in, they had a flavor intensity that you just normally do not see. Would you agree? 
very much so. Like the, the amount of detail that we had in, in Cabernet Sauvignon in, in 14, was, was, it was something. Just a, a quick aside, we have a, a sheet that we fill out on every lot of grapes that comes in. And before we put the grapes through the processing to crush and begin the fermentation, we go through a 20-point analysis of the fruit that we can go back to. We keep them in our books and we look back at how they, how they performed and see to see if there is anything, any indicators that we can draw from how the fruit looked to how the wines taste. This whole thing of winemaking is all about cause and effect. What are the consequences of what happens in the vineyard, in the cellar, to what we put on your table? And we want to capture those notes, those ideas, the conditions of the fruit on incoming that we can go back to and make some decisions for future years. I think uh, kind of highlighting what Bob's saying, when we go back and look at our notes we took from Harvest uh, 2014, you know, when we look at the actual incoming grape, we do kind of an assessment on the incoming grapes. We had the highest, uh, I guess, our, co our color liberation test. When we take some grapes, we crush them in our hand, crush them in between our fingers, put them in our mouth. It was actually the highest we'd ever gotten for co color liberation, just quickly from the grapes, no matter which grape type it was, whether it was Cabernet or Grenache or Merlot or Syrah. And I think that you can actually, you can kind of draw a cause and, or you can look at it as cause and effect because when I take a look at the 2014, it's probably, probably just about the most intensely colored wine on the table, and we can kind of look back at those notes and say, okay, that makes a lot of sense because the grapes' skins were thick, um, the grapes were very ripe in 2014, despite the fact that we, we were harvesting fairly early. We, we started picking just the first few days of September and finished up the first couple days of October, so it was about a four-week long harvest period, but the, it, we had a lot of heat in 2014. From the minute that we had bud break, uh, we just had kind of sustained heat. Not, not the super high post 100 like we, we, we saw in 2015, but a lot of, of 90, 90 plus degree days. 14, um, a big powerful vintage and the result of sustained heat and early harvest, harvested under fairly warm conditions. Yep, and you see the move also to greater and greater input of Cabernet Sauvignon and Red Mountain. This wine is 83% Red Mountain. So the winery, we were clearly moving towards that more um, proven track record that Red Mountain has established for its Cabernet Sauvignon. And just a quick comment about Red Mountain. Those of you who have been to the Appalachian know that it's not red and it's barely a mountain, okay? It's, uh, for most of the year, it's dry except for the vineyard regions. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not real tall, but it's, it's still Red Mountain, and that's its name, and that's where the Appalachian came from. But it has proven itself with a dimension of commonality, but also unique positions within the mountain itself. There are sites on the mountain that are east-facing, southeast-facing, south-facing, west-facing, northwest-facing, and now north-facing mm -hmm. on Red Mountain. And so while it's a single appellation with very few acres, I think there's, what, 4,500 acres planted? Is that a, or is it more than that now? Oh, it's, geez. It's, it's a small appellation. Yeah. Well, if not in terms of acreage planted, but a geographic area that it covers, it's the smallest appellation yes. in the state. Yeah. Okay. You have such, a, op, such an opportunity to define your personal preference based on what part of the mountain you choose to pull your fruit from. And we've been dealing with a couple of classic areas and one new area that uh, I think has given us the fruit that we're looking for for Cabernet Sauvignon Pair de Famille. You know, uh, 2014, uh, I think it's an unusual vintage for its age that it, it has so much weight, so much intensity. Uh, I think that the structure is in a lot of ways kind of hidden behind this just big amount of fruit and big shoulders. There's Texturally, it's already so attractive. It has so much going on. I think it's one of those vintages, even though it's fairly young, it's so attractive to open right now. I think that it'll age a long time, um, but it just, it, 
there's just so much to enjoy there. Like, I, I'd like to drink it right now. I'm going back two vintages and agreeing with you. I just tasted the 12 versus the 14. Mm -hmm. And the 12 has more brace, has more structure, and the 14 has this plushness and this breadth on the palate that is, in, term, in terms of those who drink their wine versus smelling their wine, and we maybe spend too much time smelling our wine, but uh, uh, 14, right now in terms of pure palate pleasure, may exceed a lot what, than what came before. Is that PPP? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, two, yes. 2015, <laughs> yeah. uh, if you, for those that worked this vintage, the winemakers that worked this vintage in Washington State, no one will ever forget it. it. It was a challenging year. It was a bit of, we like to say it was a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, we had a lot of, um, how should I put this? It, the, the season had a lot of ups and downs uh, heat accumulation wise. So we, we had a lot of, uh, I guess, We'd start out one week and we'd be at, at a 75 degree uh, high daytime temperature and by the end of the next week we'd hit 99 Fahrenheit and we kind of saw a lot of patterns like that during the season. So it was, it was tricky to, I guess, kind of gauge the speed, especially when we were getting close to harvest season, like the actual harvest period, it was kind of difficult to gauge the, the rate at which the grapes were ripening. And I know that sounds, uh, that sounds a little strange, but it's something that we always have to pay attention to during harvest season is not just going out there to the vineyards, you know, once a week or once every two weeks and saying, oh, the grapes taste good. Um, we go out there frequently to be able to kind of understand not only, you know, how close are they to ripeness, but kind of how quickly the grapes are ripening. And that certainly can be influenced by the, the seasonal weather patterns. But 2015, it was tough because of that. So we, it was always like, well, things would slow down for five or 10 days and then they'd speed back up and then they'd slow down again and they'd speed back up. And it was, it was complicated a little bit by some, some rain events that we had particularly close to harvest season but 2015 challenged us in that we had never actually picked any red grapes in August before exactly. and so we were it, it's kind of hard to live on both ends of that spectrum which is some years you could be trying to pick Merlot at the end of September and yet in 2015 we were picking it in in you know the last week of, of August so it's it definitely challenged us to say is this the right call but uh, earlier picking in 15, I think it worked out pretty well for our cellar. I think we captured a lot of freshness in, in, in the Paradis for me. This roller coaster ride that Lewis described is, is an, an enormous challenge for grape sampling. And the crew gets into the vineyard and pulls samples three times a week, four times a week sometimes to see, do we need to harvest? Do we need to harvest Monday or is it Tuesday? Is it Tuesday or is it Thursday? And we stand in the lab and we taste through these things, we run the chem analysis, et cetera, but ultimately it's based on what these things feel like and taste like on the palate. And I remember 15 as being an enormous challenge. And you looked at me and said, Bob, we need to harvest these, fruit, these grapes in August. And I thought, never in my life will I see a time when we have to harvest Washington fruit in August. I mean, come on, what, what, what kind mm. of vintage is this? Mm -hmm. And what it ended up doing was giving us very smart decision making by being as attentive to detail as we were in the vineyard sampling, as well as in the lab analyzing, and giving us a wine of power, dimension, complete lit, completeness, but still with the energy that had we not harvested the fruit early, we would have wound up with kind of flaccid and, and just kind of boring red compote versus a wine with energy, structure, and real dimension of its yeah, fruit. Yeah, tension, sure. Yeah. I mean, when you think about 2015, it was kind of the, I mean, you could, you could talk about challenges we had in, in, in every season in Washington State, but when you're talking about 15, 16, and, and 2017, each one of those vintages challenged us uh, maybe in a different way. Certainly 2015 with its early start, uh, roller coaster ride of, of, uh, of, of heat uh, kind of uh, ebbing and flowing. flowing. Uh, 2016, on the other hand, was a, a very different type of vintage. We came off of a, uh, let's see, the, the, the winter from 2015 to 2016 was quite warm. So the season actually started early in 2016. Uh, May was particularly warm. We actually broke a lot of records uh, for in, in, our, in our viticultural area in Columbia Valley for I think most heat accumulation, highest daytime temps, 
uh, warmest accumulative nighttime temp, I, I want to say as well. So we kind of, we, a lot of people put all this, da this data together at, uh, in the first few days of June of 2016. And, uh, and us internally, our, our, kind of our team, talking with other winemakers, we were kind of like, whoa, we're going to be in for a really hot, heavy, early season. And so that, we, were kind of, we had that in the back of our mind already. In fact, the data supported that May 30th of 2016, had higher heat accumulation than 2015 at the same date. Bingo. Yeah. And, and 2015, we challenged us for early harvest and heat accumulation. So we, we kind of, from that, from looking, looking in that in June, looking back at May, from, from June, we were like, well, we, we're, we're really going to have to be active in the exactly. vineyard, yeah, pay a lot of attention. But I, I think uh, what Bob always likes to, when he talks about heat accumulation, or I guess seasonal weather patterns, and talking about heat, it's not just about total accumulation, it's about distribution. And it's something that Bob said for, for a long time. And, and I think 2016 might um, highlight that more than any other season that I can think of, because uh, it, if you look at just the total heat accumulation we had over the season, it's not that different from 2014 or 2015, but uh, the distribution was quite different. We had most of our heat early in the season, and as the season, uh, as we got closer to the harvest period, uh, we actually started, I guess mid-season we started our heat accumulation was a little more comparable to 2012, which we, Bob likes to say is pretty close to the long-term average, 2012. Mm -hmm. And by the time we get into the final ripening months, uh, really the end of August, uh, all of September, and certainly October, uh, the grapes were ripening, particularly Cabernet Sauvignon, under pretty cool conditions. The skins were uh, a little thinner than we'd usually see for Cabernet Sauvignon. And uh, a saying that, I, or a, I guess a, a famous French quote is, uh, <laughs> August makes the must, and I think in the new world we could mostly say September makes the must. And what that means is that final ripening period really uh, kind of sh can shape the character quality of the wine maybe more than the other parts of the season. And I think 2016 is a perfect example of that. I think when you, when you actually sit down and taste the wine like we're doing right now, we see that the texture is very fine, maybe, maybe more more generous right now than a lot of other vintages of Pair de Femme on, on either side of it. It just it, the result of those thinner skins, thinner doesn't mean bad, thicker doesn't mean good, one or the other. It's just, I think there's a, a texture in 2016 that we were able to capture that we don't often see. This wine has extraordinary dimension. A dimension of big fruits, but fruits that have delineation. And I'm going through, I, I've got a, a litany of terms that I'm, I'm just kind of thinking of with this, in this, this blue, blue fruit, which I don't commonly get blue fruit out of a lot of Cabernet, but this one has some blueberry, certainly blackberry and cassis and eucalyptus and a little bit of rose petal and fresh tobacco and graphite and just the slightest hint of oak smoke. Um, this, it, plus, it's a wine of real dimension. And I think August made the, month, the must on this wine. August was still generous in terms of its heat. And then we cooled down and we preserved that fruit beam that's mm -hmm. coming through in this wine. Uh, it's an extraordinary vintage. Uh, 2017, kind of the, the third vintage that uh, I'll never forget. I think a lot of us will never forget. Um, unusual for a number of reasons. That winter was actually very cold. That 2016, 2017 winter was very cold. I remember after the harvest, boy, we must have been going to maybe WAG uh, to, to do a presentation, but I, I reached out to a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of our different growers in the Columbia Valley, and I kind of asked them for some notes on the harvest season, and I remember asking uh, Mike Sauer, and he, so he, kinda, he, he, he sent me his notes, and he talked about uh, being out in the vineyard and worried about how long and how cold it had been out in the vineyard, so they, they took some heavy equipment that went out, and they actually measured the permafrost, how deep it was actually out in the vineyard, and I don't recall what that was exactly, but it was certainly enough to make him worry about like just how cold it was. You know, he was worried about vine damage. Yeah. Yep. So that gives you an idea of just how cold that, that, that winter was from 2016 to uh, 2017. And, and so why I'm, I'm, I'm bringing that up, pointing it out is um, we actually had a very late start to the season in 2017. It was, it was very late. And I remember some of our earliest trips out to the vineyard um, talking with the different growers. I think there were a lot of comparisons kind of where we were along the evolution or how much heat accumulation we had had so far in the season. Uh, most people were comparing it to either 2010 or 2011. And so that's 
that's kind of what, wh how the season started was kind of a, a later than normal bud break and starting with very cool weather. And I think there's one more other thing that I think you could, you could highlight or kind of bring into the conversation, which is if you talk to growers that have been doing this long enough, 10 years, 20 years, most of them have, have noticed that if you, if you start your season late, like if you start bud break late, later than normal, you're usually gonna start your harvest later than normal. And if you actually have an early bud break, you know, n nine out of 10 times, you're gonna actually harvest your grapes early. So that, that was kind of the context of which we, we kind of looked at the vintage as, as things started to go. But unlike 2016, it was almost the, the opposite effect of 2016, where the season, in 2016, the season got cooler. 2017, the, the, the season actually, finally, by the time we get into June, things really start picking up. And then they got very hot, like historically hot. So we actually were, were facing some, some, some pretty long stretches, like duration-wise, long stretches of, of sustained heat, uh, 100 degree Fahrenheit, that actually we were getting a little worried about. And at the same time, and I, I'll never forget this, at the same time, we were dealing with wildfires in the north of us in British Columbia and in the south of us in the Columbia Gorge. And so there was this high, I'm talking high elevation um, smoke layer that was actually, you could say, buffering some of uh, the light intensity and heat accumulation, and it actually, in the end, actually kind of worked to our advantage during a, maybe two or three key long stretches, eight day stretches of sustained heat where we thought, they actually predicted that we might hit 106, 107, 108 Fahrenheit on Red Mountain, and it never materialized because we actually had that, that smoke layer, I'm talking high elevation now, um, that actually kind of moderated the temperature to where we only just crested 100 Fahrenheit. And let me tell you the, the difference between 100 Fahrenheit or 101 and actually realizing 108, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. And how lucky were we that it was high elevation haze versus the actual smoke? Um, we probably had more smoke here on the western side of the mountains we did. than in the vineyards. And it was lower. And so there was some real concern about lung health and all those things. Uh, but in the vineyards, it was a very high haze, so there was really no smoke taint um, in the vineyards. Uh, you know, I, I still have not tasted a 17 that has had, from any vineyard, any, any winery mm -hmm. in Washington that had any smoke taint associated with it, which is, thank you, yeah. you know, this was, this was great stuff. Um, what, what it gave us though, you, I, I loved your reference back to 10 and 11, and what I saw with the 17 is a wine of a similar character, but with a little more generosity mm -hmm. than the 10 and 11 have right now. And I think that's because of the dimension of heat in August, built a little bit richer must, and gave us a wine with a little higher dry extract, um, uh, more components in the, uh, in the, in the wine. And um, sit on this one, okay? Uh, the 17 is, uh, is a wonderful wine for the seller. Drink some of these earlier vintages and wait for these 17s to have a couple more years on them before you start. If you do drink it now, a couple hours in a decanter, but it's, I, it's all there. That's what's essential. It is. I love the concentration in 2017. We, we had some historically low yields, naturally. Um, in 2017, mm -hmm. particularly with Cabernet Sauvignon. So I think that it's, it's probably somewhere, it's probably on par with the 2014 for being a, a very concentrated vintage for Cabernet Sauvignon. So we've taken a little more time than we typically do, but we've had 15 wines to go through here. And what a delight for us. We hope um, you're still with us. I hope you didn't fall asleep. Okay, as we were going through these, um, but what, a, what an opportunity for us to taste through these wines and hopefully along the way you picked up a tidbit or two of when to open wines in your cellar and begin enjoying them. Do you have a favorite in there, Bob? If, if, I, if I was to just pin you down and say, is there a favorite? It doesn't matter what the reason is. It can be for the, the, the way it tastes or memories of harvest or is there, is there a favorite in there? I'm gonna do by groups, uh, 16, 12 and they tie for different reasons, the 12 Cabernet Père de Famille and the 12 Le Perrin. And this may be a surprise to you, but the 08. Okay. I love the energy behind the 08. Uh, 07 maybe it would be in there too. So 
I didn't give you one favorite. I gave you five or six. Five. Um, those are my favorites. You know, there's, I like different wines for different reasons. I love the stylistic range we see in here, like the, the, the texture of the 16, the exotic fruit of the 15, the power and depth of, of blackberry and blackcurrant in the 16. Right now, the way they're drinking, oof, 12 La Perrine yeah. is lovely, and I love the contrast between the 12 Père de Famille and 12 La Perrine. And, you know, that's maybe the lingering message for me is uh, same vineyards, same cellar, same winemaker, same mentality, same philosophy behind these wines, and knowing the barrels the way that we know them and being able to do that sort of detailed selection mm -hmm. is one of the great advantages of a small winery and um, took advantage of it. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Louis. Cheers. Bravo. Yep. Well done. Thank you for joining us during this vertical tasting experience with our founder, Bob Betts, and winemaker, Louis Skinner. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter or visit our website to learn more about the team and the wines we make here at Betts Family Winery.